Well, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. It's Excellent. great to be here. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Burgess, could you tell us um, the story behind the uh, reflections of the rock lobster? Absolutely. It was a, a book that I had read over 30 years ago when it first was introduced. And it basically chronicles a young man uh, in Providence, or just outside of Providence, Rhode Island, who sued his high school in 1980 for the right to bring his boyfriend to the prom. And he won uh, the court case, and it has been a trend-setting uh, court decision ever since. So even today, it's still being cited uh, when these kinds of cases come up. Oh, great. Wonderful. Um, could you tell me about how the, how the, the story um, became like a play. How did that all happen? Well, I read the book, as I said, so many years ago, and okay. I've always kept it in my trunk. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a writer and have been a writer professionally for some time and had always wanted to adapt it into something uh, for the stage. And when I first came on board at Boston Children's Theater five, four or five years ago, uh, I proposed the idea of doing a series of plays th of justice through the eyes of a child. So we began with the diary of Anne Frank, and then we moved on to the 50th anniversary of To Kill a Mockingbird, and Reflections of a Rock Lobster was the third installment in that particular series. Okay, right. And so you you took you read the book and then you a adapted it for the play yourself. Is the yeah, I, I well I you know had had this book for so long, and I always thought it was such an extraordinary story of uh, story of courage, and kind of a David and Goliath you know uh, theme. And so I took me a number of months to even track down the author, Aaron Frick, who was presently living in San Francisco, Okay. and um, contacted him. And I was very pleased to finally be in touch with him and tell him how uh, admiring I was of his book and of his story. And he was thrilled by the idea of uh, it reawakening. I think it's every bit as relevant today as it was at the time that it was written. Excellent. That's wonderful. Yeah. So it was great. It was a great experience putting it together. Fantastic. So, Felix, tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a freshman at Emerson College. Yep, uh, I'm a BA acting freshman, and um, I've uh, been involved with theater since I was in the fourth grade, but I sort of fell in love with it my sophomore year of high school and decided I wanted to do it professionally. And um, that's how I got involved with Boston Children's Theater because, um, you know, I was sort of searching through for uh, programs in the city in my area, and it was um, you know, by a great deal, the most professional um, training that was available. Oh, fantastic. So. And what other roles have you done besides Reflections of a Rock Lobster? Um, I did uh, a couple roles in high school. I was in a couple Shakespeare plays, some musicals. Um, I've done the summer program with Boston Children's Theater two years um, in a row. Um, so I was in the shows over the summer then. And um, I've been, I'm now in some, some shows at Emerson College. So. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah. So we're going to start off by just actually showing a clip of you, mm -hmm. um, and this is actually a clip of you kind of, well actually, actually we'll start off with a clip talking about, it's your co-star, right, if you will, he's going to talk about yes. what it's like to be in love with a man. Right. Uh, fantastic. So um, we're going to look at this clip. Oh, so they didn't even notice when I slipped out of the back seat and escaped into the sanctuary of my room. <laughs> Paul was the first openly gay person I'd ever met. He'd actually said it out loud. He'd said he was gay and the devil hadn't risen out of the ground to claim him. <laughs> the sky hadn't fallen. Even more shocking was that he said he was gay and he was happy to be so. It never occurred to me that gay people could actually be proud of who they are. So tell us a little bit about this clip and then tell us about how your character relates to this character. Mm -hmm. Well, um, this clip comes from a point in the show. This is after uh, Aaron and Paul have been uh, starting their relationship. They've just started to sort of get involved with each other. And Paul is the only openly gay student at his high school. Um, and he's very proud of that. And he has a, a very uh, activist streak in him. That was inspired by a mentor of his, John Delaney. And, uh, so he wants to be able to sue the school to take a boy to the prom, but he's only 17, so he's you know, sort of in the market for a boy to go to the prom with so that he can, he can try and fight for this right. And uh, through the course of the beginning of the play, he happens upon Aaron, and they start this really wonderful relationship where Paul is that, becomes a mentor for him 
um, because Aaron is gay and, and in the closet and doesn't really know how to come to terms with that and, and be open about that. And Paul has had that experience and is, uh, loves Aaron and also loves the opportunity to help him explore that part of himself. Great. So they really work together to kind right. of figure help each mm -hmm. other with the self-awareness piece and then kind of figure out, well, how do we, they really make the high school entirely aware <laughs> right, yeah. of the whole experience in a very positive way. Yeah. Um, absolutely. The, the, definitely the goal of all of this for Paul, for Aaron, is uh, just to be able to share who they are, be happy and proud to be who they are and in the school with their families, everything. Um, but, I mean, there's definitely negative backlash in this school, of course, right, at the time. Right, absolutely. Because um, you think about it, it would be every young, young, young person's right to be able to share who they are absolutely. and express who they are in school. Um, right. But unfortunately, it wasn't. It's, we're getting, we've made a lot of progress, but yes. was, this is a very groundbreaking thing that this young man mm -hmm. is doing, to say, okay, I'm out, I'm proud, I have a boyfriend, and I want to go to the prom. Right. So what was it like for you to be part of this production? Well, you know, it, it was... Great, it was such a blessing in, in so many different ways. First, um, the opportunity to work with the teen ensemble over such a, a long period of time. We became so close and um, you know, it really let us share a lot of ourselves and really um, involve a lot of our own stories in this story. Um, but also the, the activism of the piece was something that we were all extraordinarily proud of because um, you know, it's, it's sort of, every actor's dream to be able to not only do what they love, but also be able to affect a change in somebody by doing it. And especially such an issue that all of us involved with the production felt so strongly about. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an extremely passionate um, issue. Yeah, and, 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 you know, to be able to bring that to so many people in such a powerful way. You know, mm -hmm. you can read a manual and right. I often hand out manuals to people and they're like, a manual? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I don't have the time to read this. Well, you can yeah. show someone a show and you can really, you know, it right. changes minds. It changes, you know, grandparents mm -hmm. and young people. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that bullying was so mm -hmm. intense and affected people that way. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And, and when we were developing the piece, you know, I realized that being 30 years past being a teenager myself, I needed to hear their generation's voice on this. So BCT selected 15 individuals from different socioeconomic backgrounds, different communities, both gay and straight, male and female, et cetera, and brought them all together for approximately a year to do a workshop of wow. these topics and have them really weigh in. It was actually the kids that pushed this piece to the absolute edge. They were the wow. ones who were saying, these wow. are the things that I'm seeing. I'm, I'm from the generation of, we didn't do anything more daring in high school than Oklahoma. So right. the, <laughs> yeah, right. the idea of, and even though, you know, Jed, the Jed scene was always a little bit, had to be played down, <laughs> it's a little too violent. So um, these kids were the ones that gave me the courage and the voice to really reach out to their generation. Even though this is a piece of history, it still has very strong relevance mm -hmm. for today. Yes. And it was through that workshop that we really found the voice of the play. Wow, that's, that's fantastic great. to have that level of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good point where we look at another clip um, because I think it speaks volumes. And this is the two young men getting ready to go to the prom, I yeah, believe. With police escort. Oh, <laughs> whoa. <Yeah. laughs> Which some young people would like, but <laughs> in this case, not. not uh... So let's look at this clip. Boston Globe asked if you could photograph us doing this. That's sweet. Eh, just another cover shot for the freak show. Well, how do I look? You're not going to be embarrassed to be seen with me in front of Walter Cronkite? Ah, you look really handsome. Thanks. You've got the best looking date at the whole prom. I know. How do I look? Easy. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, Burgess, can you describe some of the process that you went into writing the play and how it, you know, how, how it particularly played out for you as, Absolutely. A, as a writer? Um, it, was a, it was a very interesting process. I, you know, I've never worked in a collaborative way like this before. Usually it's the writer by themselves conceiving and p putting this all together. But this year-long process of workshops really helped me get a different perspective, still maintain uh, a certain sense of truth to the 
actual historical incidents. So basically, I, I created a, an outline based on what was happening you know, through this. The book takes place over like a three-year period, three period or so. I condensed it into one full academic year. So it starts in September, it ends at graduation, you et cetera. You wrote it well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was really a combination of the historical you know, documents, the court transcripts, et cetera, statements that were made uh, by various individuals who were involved with the case at that time, and then finding a humanity to it. You know, for instance, in the, in the, the book, there's a, there's a, it's a very cursory uh, paragraph about him coming out to his parents. In the play, it actually becomes you know, a 10 minute, 15 minute scene okay. in which he struggles with the idea, struggles with the words, and then ultimately struggles with their reactions, which are not very positive. Um, I think it's a, it's a situation that many kids described in talking about it during the workshops and what it's like, what every gay person goes through in that process of coming out to family and friends. Are they still going to love me once they find out who I really am? And right. that is the struggle that we've invested in Aaron. Um, and Paul's character, you know, played by Felix, uh, you know, his parents threw him out. When he came out, um, they said, out, you're out, kid, you're done. Wow. And, um, so those contrasts, those experiences of that uh, growth between the, the adults and the kids, I think, is, is a very stark contrast. That was a piece and a moment in the play that I thought really worked well, and it was a great a deal of fun to write, just because I thought we're not just talking about one individual's case here. We're talking about such a common experience that so many young uh, GLBT youth Absolutely. So what, do you, what has been the impact in schools um, where, where this, uh, where you brought the play to? Well, it's been kind of extraordinary. We were a little bit uh, sideswiped by the reaction that we've received from teachers, from students, from parents. You know, I got a, a lovely, lovely email from a young man who had said he brought his daughter, who's in the sixth grade, and her question to him at the intermission is, "Why are these people being so mean to him? He didn't do anything. He wow. didn't do anything wrong." And she, he said, we went out after the show and with my daughter. It was just he and his daughter alone. And he said, we had the most extraordinary conversation that I've ever shared with my child. And wow. he said, thank you for that. Thank you for that opportunity. We had kids at the talk back uh, you know, after the show that came out right there in front of their class. We had teachers that went back and came out in front of their oh, classes. Wow. Uh, <laughs> came out to their schools. You know, It's been an extraordinary reaction. And not here just locally, either. We've had reactions and very positive feedback, uh, not only nationally, you know, nationally, but even internationally. There's interest in uh, production in Germany right now. Okay. Oh, you know, wow. So it's really been extraordinary. It seems like we've tapped into something that is very universal, obviously very topical and very relevant today. Yeah, That's no, an it's an extremely pressing issue. Over 40% of homeless youth are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgendered. And that seems like a hugely disproportionate amount of young adults that are on the streets in unsafe Absolutely. conditions, um, in, in, in real peril. And LGBT youth are far more likely to attempt suicide at some point in their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, I think all of those things, by seeing you know, your story up on stage in a public forum, and not only just seeing it portrayed and seeing it for all the violence and all the difficulty, but then seeing this young man triumph, and not with his fists, but with using the Constitution, using the courts, using his brain, to get and navigate himself through this. It's really extraordinary how collaboratively this formed together to make this landmark decision. Yes, and you speak of kind of the, the triumphant point. So there's a great clip, and will you, will you describe it a little bit, set us up. We're gonna show the clip with him, and he's, um, he's actually dancing with his partner. Um, Felix is dancing, Felix's character is dancing with the other young man, and other people join him. Yes, uh, that was the thing that always inspired me about the most about it. And you were asking me about the process of writing the play. This is actually the scene I wrote the first because I always start with the scene that's the most vivid to me. Okay. Ah. Um, when he, when Paul and Aaron first took the dance floor, 500 kids cleared, and they were left all by themselves in the spotlight with their police escorts because this was such an aberration. No one had ever thought this would appear on a high school dance floor. And it looked as though they were about to be kicked off the dance floor, and uh, one of the teachers said, play something upbeat, say, play something fast. So they chose the B-52's Rock Lobster, which was very popular at the time. Paul and Aaron began dancing, and gradually the other kids began filtering onto the dance floor until finally the entire student body had joined them. And that, to me, I thought was the most 
uh, resonant message of the whole piece, that ultimately they were kids. They were the new generation. They just wanted to be together, and they wanted to support, ultimately, Aaron and Paul, but they didn't know how, and they finally found their opportunity in the final scene. That's great. Wow. No, oh, that's very powerful because a lot of young adults, that is what I hear in trainings and things like that and experience. I want to be supportive. I just don't know how. Absolutely. You know, what do I say yeah. if someone comes out to me? What do I do if I'm a bystander and someone's bullying me? And this show really takes you through it and helps you get ideas it, and, it does. and your workshops. And many of the kids have said, you know, I would not have probably said something in the past, but now after having been part of the show or having witnessed it, I would definitely step in and say something and have, in fact, said something, you know, been dare to be different. <laughs> dare right. to go against the grain. Right, absolutely. And, and how has being part of this production, Felix, kind of shaped your thinking around um, just the issues? And Well, the issue is always significant to me um, just because I, I actually come from a school that's very gay friendly um, and I grew up in a neighborhood that was very gay friendly so the idea was kind of foreign to me just the extremes to which people would go to torment somebody like Aaron, somebody who's done, you know, like the sixth grade girl said, has done absolutely nothing wrong and is just trying to be himself. Um, so first to come in, in contact with this extraordinary story um, was kind of a, a pretty stark wake up call for me to realize how bad it was mm. and how far we've come. But then we went through a long process in the show talking about how bad it still is for a lot of kids. And in some ways, you could make the argument that it's, it's almost gotten worse because of all the cyber bullying, whereas mm. kids used to be able to leave school, go home, yes. be with their families, escape for 12 hours until they go back to school. Nowadays, that kind of bullying follows them home, and that kind of constant torment it just takes a toll you know, such a strong toll on a person. So it definitely inspired activism for me and, and uh, a lot of the other kids in the show, um, you know, in their schools and their communities. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. No, that's a good point. The social media is so powerful. Yeah. And, and to manage it, and especially for young people who don't really have the social media savvy to say it's right. just on social media. And a lot of young adults can also do it anonymously, right. which they become sometimes they're trying out who they are and who they want to be, and sometimes it's, yeah. it's not very nice. Yeah, and that's part of the relevance of the show, too, I think, is that even though, obviously, the story takes place before mm -hmm. social media, it teaches that it's not cowardly to go over somebody's head to say, you know, I'm not going to challenge you directly. I'm going to go to the next level up, which is what Aaron does, going to the court system and suing and uh, getting himself protection. Um, you know, kids who are in those kind of situations, they need to know that it's, it's brave to be able to do that, to be able to say, I'm not going to involve myself directly with this. I'm going to go to the next person up who can, who can protect me and, and enforce my rights as right. a human being. One of the quotes that came back and resonated for us throughout the process of this play is actually a Martin Luther King quote. I'm sure I won't get it exactly, but it's something to the effect of, you know, history never remembers the actions of the bad people. It remembers the appalling silence of the good people. Mm. And yes. I feel that that is very much what the, the theme of what this play reflects. Yeah, absolutely. And we see that's very relevant now in Africa with some of the things that are absolutely. coming out in the Congo right now and, and, and people who yeah. remain silent during the genocide. Mm -hmm. So these themes kind of resonate in different venues and different places and around the world. Yes. It's so important to help young people find their voice, and it sounds very much that's what Boston Children's Theater does, is to help the young people find their voice, to advocate for one another, to support one another, and help each other move forward. At Boston Children's Theater, I developed what I call the No Diva Zone. Everyone is there. <laughs> <laughs> difficult to create sometimes, it I'm is, sure. It can be difficult to create, but we actually have it as part of our contract, with both students and parents wow. have to sign, and that means that everyone is there, everyone is valued. Wow. Everyone is celebrated and no one's there to be the star, no one's there to catch the spotlight. And I always remind kids that for every person you see on stage, there are five people backstage that made that person look as good as they do. So it's all about community, it's all yes. about collaboration, it's all about coming together. And we're not out to create stars, we're out to create artists. And I think that's mm -hmm. a very, very different philosophy than perhaps some other places might, might champion. Right. No, absolutely. It's because great. the star can come and go, but an artist is always there and, exactly. and always 
Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you look at anyone who has an enduring career, you find that there's a really good person underneath all of that and that they're welcoming and that they embrace everyone and that they're all part of it. Absolutely. And that's a huge tenet of Boston Children's Theater as well, to make it accessible to all young adults. Absolutely. We have a very strict policy which reflects that we do not ever turn any child away for the lack of ability to pay. And uh, that we have a very active scholarship program. And all, every child that participates in our training or in our uh, audience pro uh, program, uh, I think we have like 40% of them are on some port of, portion of a scholarship. Wow. wow. What's, what's the percentage of like suburban to urban kids in, in your program? We have a, a healthy mix. It's about 50-50 actually. We have kids from as far away as Maine and New Hampshire and Vermont. We have kids as far away as Connecticut. Wow. Um, you know, wow. We have kids that come in on Saturdays to study with us from Pennsylvania. I mean, some kids that actually fly in, you know, just because they love the community and wow. the environment of what we offer at BCT. Wow. I feel very proud of that because we work very hard to create that kind of an environment. And they will say, you know, this is not what it feels like at my high school. You know, this is not what it feels like in some of my other programming, uh, you know, that I've been participating in. Wow, that's fantastic. And in thinking around kind of if a young adult was here, and, and I'd, like to, I'd like to flash up your website, so if someone was interested and they're watching the show and they're thinking like, wow, I'd love to be involved. How does someone become involved? Mm -hmm. how, do they, um, how would they get in contact with you? If we kind of show the website and um, think about kind of, it's, it, they can contact you via email, via phone, through Absolutely. the website. Yeah, we're we have very it up now. easy to reach, you know. Uh, and as a matter of fact, if you type up on Google, uh, Boston Children's Theater or Children's Theater where I think that the second or third listing that comes up on there nationwide so oh, wow. okay. it's a very easy thing to reach and you just contact our website we have a list of all the classes daily classes programming etc and then of course all of our shows that we offer throughout the season as well oh fantastic fantastic so Felix if there was a young person out there that said you know this sounds great but it also sounds kind of like whoa very intimidating what it, what would you say to them to encourage them to be part of Boston Children's Theater what's kind of the best thing about being involved? Well, the, the best thing is actually how easy it is to get involved back because I only, there are people who were working with Boston Children's Theater ever since they were six years old and I only came along in my junior year to start wow. working with them and within the first week, two weeks of classes, I felt like I'd been there just as long as the right. people okay. who had grown up with them. Um, everybody is so welcoming and so excited just to, to have a family of people who are passionate about the arts, passionate about theater, and, and who want to create something really meaningful. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. And so what's next for you? For me, um, I'm actually next week. I'm filming a video for an anti-suicide, anti-depression campaign. Wow. It's going to be shown in um, middle schools across the country. Wow. So, sort of continuing the activism and acting together. Um, and uh, then Rock Lobster is reopening here um, in March. So, I'm excited about that. Yes. So that's coming up. So that's there's a lot of a um, lot of things going on to prepare for that for March. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Fantastic. So could you talk to us a little bit about some of your upcoming productions? I know you've had one coming up in uh, December, we which do. is we Days Away. We do. We have something away. that's completely different. <laughs> um, it's the, an adaptation of The Velveteen Rabbit, which is, of course, a wonderful classic. Although thematically, it actually is very much the same. It's all about realizing yourself and recognizing uh, to make yourself your own priority, etc. And um, realizing uh, an awareness. So that starts for the, the young children. You know, we have that for preschool up through, you know, age eight, although we have many, many families that attend that. And so that's coming up uh, with uh, both puppetry and live actors. And then we move into the next season after that with, of course, Rock Lobster. We have um, uh, Schoolhouse Rock, which is another show that's going to be produced at our production, at our, with our year. And we have Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. <laughs> We've great, all had those, we yes. We all understand And we that. need to be able to talk about them, That's absolutely. That's a very, very strong theme um, of pieces that we have. So we have kind of, we, tr we cover every age range throughout our seasons. We start with the small children, and we work all the way up through the young adults and try to reach everybody within one season's time. Fantastic, fantastic. So as we wrap up, do you have kind of thoughts on where would you like to see Rock Lobster go? 
Well, you know, Rock Lobster is kind of assuming its own life. You know, it's a story <laughs> it's that's been on, out yeah. there for a long time. We got a lot of national press on it continue to. Uh, my associate just got back from San Francisco. They're interested in producing it out there as wow. well. And um, this year we're going to be partnering with PFLAG, which is Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And they're going to be interested in doing both pre and post workshops, which I'm oh, very wow. excited about. And you know, we've been talking to them about a national tour as well, um, wow. taking it to the national office of PFLAG in Washington D.C., and then taking it to several major metropolitan areas and using youth from those communities to play the high school students in each of these various communities, so that it can be as much a part of their community as it has been here in Boston. Wow, that's a fantastic vision. That would be really cool. Well, Thank we you. hope to be able to see that. That Me would be too. great. <laughs> <laughs> and Felix, would you be no, on board yeah. for that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. Well, we'd like to say thank you very much uh, for being with us today. We really appreciate sharing uh, Reflection of a Rock Lobster and, and all the wonderful things that Boston Children's Theater has done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd say thank you to our audience for once again tuning in for Picking Up the Pieces, where we dare to persevere to help young adults reach their full potential. We'd like to say thank you to the Department of Mental Health for sponsoring our show. Um, we'd also like you to look out for that young adult that might be in need of that extra special community or that extra special attention they might need to reach their full potential. This is Kim Bissett and Michael Travellini saying having a wonderful day. Thank you.